Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about the economic situation of Pakistan and especially the recommendations uh, from the IMF regarding the tax reforms in Pakistan. And uh, we'll also be uh, talking about the uh, special package of the Prime Minister for the textile industry. Other than that, as we all know that uh, the State Bank of Pakistan uh, has uh, kept its uh, interest rate at 7%. So that is something which should remain there. It should be pretty much lowered, but still, at least it's much better than what we have witnessed earlier when it was hovering around 14%. Uh, and obviously, when we talk about Corona, and now the report is that the schools will be closed to the 20th of uh, uh, January. So obviously, this second wave seems to be pretty serious. And a lot of people are losing their lives. So many people all over the world are getting infected. Just uh, look at the numbers and they are really, really, really concerning. Uh, but uh, how to move forward in these times, that is the, <coughs> I think, question of the hour. So we'll be talking about this in detail. Let me introduce you to our panelists. We have with us uh, in our studio, uh, Shakil Ramesab. Ramesab needs no introduction. Is a senior uh, economist, is a writer. Thank you so much, Ramesab. And we'll also be talking to Zia Bande Saab, who is the executive director for Center of the Street Economy. And uh, Zia Saab is joining us on Skype. Zia Saab, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time as well. And uh, we'll also be talking to Dr. Salman Shah, the former uh, Minister for Finance. And uh, we'll be taking him over the telephone and we'll be also uh, taking his review over the government's <coughs> policy. But let me put the first question to you, Rami Saab. Now, uh, when we talk about the deal with the IMF, and it is about a big package of $6 billion. Now, in those particular circumstances, they have reviewed our uh, tax system and we have done so many shows and we have come up actually with so many solutions also. I'm not sure why not uh, those uh, recommendations are taken seriously. But at the end of the day, again, simple as that, that you need to increase certain tariffs, you need to increase the per unit price of electricity and gas for that matter. If you're not sorting out your tax system, then everybody has to pay. Your take. Uh, let uh, let me start by a uh, verse from the uh, Ghalib. He said, Pite te kars ki meh, or kate te laegi hamari faka masti. So, it is a bad strategy to go for the loans. And we have adopted it. And uh, I would say it's uh, unwise to go for so much for the loans, and every time you are going for loan, loan, land, loan. What is the reason behind these loans? If we, I, I will not talk about a very, a very long ago in the past when we started this, uh, this uh, you can say, reform structures, structural adjustment program from 1988 and onward. We are spending so much money, we are taking so much money, and we are doing every type of the reforms under the instructions of IMF and other, and other uh, intellectual financial institutions. Still, we are there and not there. We are getting worse and worse day by day. In the last 30 years, if you look at these statistics from where we started and where we are today, despite all the efforts of the current government, we are still facing a number of problems. And interestingly, interestingly, this is, this is very interesting for me. IMF, which is advising Pakistan from 1988, go for reforms and they are saying oh, we are working with the government of Pakistan for reforms, but they are not ready to take the blame. So, where they made mistakes? It is need to be understood. It is not only Pakistan you can say. So, we always apply for the loans and they come to rescue our economy and that is how it works. So, it is, I mean uh, they are not forcing you to take the loans. No, no, this is apparent. There are the different instruments which has been applied on Pakistan for mm -hmm. after the Washington consensus. They are asking us to do the every type of reforms without thinking about either these are good or bad for the country. And if you are not following them, they say, oh, we will not review your, uh, uh, your next uh, installment. So, if we look at that from 1988 when we went and started the reforms. So, we were going through reforms in the prices of subsidies and everything they are telling us. The fundamental question is, the most of the time the loans which are coming to Pakistan, they are consumptive in the nature. They are not a productive in the nature. 
So, what we are doing, either we are doing just to make the make sure some arrangements or to make up some uh, budget deficits or the current account deficits or do some reforms or something like that. But we are not using those loans to create a direct industrial base or to boost our agriculture system and introducing the fourth industrial revolution in the country. So, what we are doing? We are always doing these that are taking the loans to cover the budget deficits. Are we going to that? Oh, our reserves are getting worse, so we need some uh, cushion from somewhere. That's so how it, it works. So, so that means if government of Pakistan is doing bad for the last thirty years, so we are uh, we accept this effects of the government. But, but doing good. I, before I go to Bande Sab, so just also clear me and educate me on this. That there was a time I still remember that uh, Shaukat Adi Sab, our former Prime Minister, comes on the television screen and says that you know, humne kashkol. Now, no more loans from IMF and we are uh, IMF free now and this is how we are going to go forward now. And at that time, I remember that particular year, the economic growth was around 8.4 percent and that was brilliant. So, look, why it now, happened? So, why he was saying? There were two fundamental things. During the Musharraf era, we did two things very uh, marvelously. Number one, so our tax to GDP ratio. If you talk to the Yusuf Abdullah Saab, he will explain you how they increase the tax to GDP ratio. If you look after the uh, Musharraf era, our number of the taxpayer has been decreased. Ideally, it should increase, but after the Musharraf era, so we are less than 1 million taxpayers. So that is very astonishing to see if the Musharraf was able to bring these people in the tax net, why these people are now no more in the tax net? One thing and second thing. If you talk about uh, the Punjab government at that time, Pervez Lai, he put too much focus on agriculture. He gave the loans to the agriculture, he worked with the agric agriculture community, he bring the best minds of the for the agriculture. So your know, agriculture started to give the more input, a, a output. So it get it started to get better. So maybe we should learn through these two policies from the Musharraf era, one from the Punjab, what the Pervez Lai was doing with the agriculture and the social sector. Agriculture, I am saying, because it was a, a, the, more, the livelihoods Sir, of millions of people. I still remember the Padalikha Punjab. <coughs> Padalikha Punjab. And, and then the 1122 service for medical. These are the social things. Exactly. I am talking about the agriculture. I think that the credit goes if to. You look, if you look at the statistics of those era, uh, that era, you will find the, our credit was increasing like this one. Peaking. So, if they were also giving other types of the facilitation to the farmers in terms of the market in terms of purchasing their output. All right. So, these were the two things which happened in the Musharraf era. After that, despite the fact we had CPAC from 2013. I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back on that, sir. Let me put another question here. And this time it's for uh, Bande Sahib. Bande Sahib, uh, when you look at the interest rate of Pakistan, that is around 7%. When you comp and, and I'm talking about the Corona times. Uh, earlier, I still remember, not very long ago, it was hovering around almost at a double digit, 14 percent. Now, when you look at the European interest rates, American is almost at a zero, UK at 0.25 percent. And when you compare a country like Pakistan with such a huge population, Corona obviously is uh, literally, you know, is, is multiplying on daily basis. Look at the condition in India and Iran for that matter. And uh, I mean, the region is experienced the, the, the effect of this in terms of economy. Now, so looking at the numbers, the digits, uh, the text to GDP ratio, I was having a word with uh, the newly appointed uh, special assistant to the prime minister on revenue, uh, Dr. Vakar Masood. And he said, yes, we are around 9.5 percent, and but we really want to go forward around 14, 15 percent. Now, the question is how? That, that's, that seems to be the problem. Those who are already paying the taxes are being squeezed more. Those who are out of the net, we always end up hearing that the tax base is going to be broadened. It is not broadened yet, sir. Bande sir. Okay, you have two parts of your question. One is concerning fiscal easing, which you are talking about reduction in interest rate. And second about improving the tax to GDP ratio. For myself, as humble student of economics. All economics is political economy. And our prime minister has, I think so very rightly said also and mentioned also off and on in his speeches that Pakistan has a big issue of regulatory capture. So when you are talking about easing out of these uh, interest rates also, 
who are the beneficiaries? Uh, they are the beneficiaries of the small and medium industries? I don't think so. Most of the beneficiaries of all the government, if you look at the government side, all the incentives, major incentives, are being captured by the elite. So is the elite sufficient enough to push this economy up? Unfortunately, it is not. We cannot just close our eyes. Between 2008 and 2018, this 10 years period, our GDP, and if I compare it with Bangladesh, our GDP grew during the same period at around 85%. We became 85% more. And during the same period, Bangladesh GDP increased by 199%. And if you look at uh, per capita GDP, Bangladesh has now a population growth rate below 1%. And Pakistan population growth rate is over 2%. So yeah. Eventually, our per capita GDP improved by below 50%. Whereas in the Bangladesh side, it improved by 167%. Now, it means that as of today, I mean to say we have recently heard also that Bangladesh nominal GDP has basically crossed even India. It is, has become highest in the South Asian region. So it is uh, what when, when you are talking about these text to GDP ratio and all those things, you need to understand till the time we don't have that focus of a broad based economic growth. You will not be able to improve these text to GDP ratio. The trust of the people they reduces on the state institutions. And once that they reduce those trust, then eventually why people are going to pay you the tax? They are going to evade it, evade it because they don't have a trust. And this was very well articulated by the president of World Bank in last year's speech also at Georgetown University, if I remember correctly. And he mentioned that thing over there also because at that time he just visited Pakistan. He came back from Pakistan and he did mention that, that this is an issue that the people are losing the trust. Till the time institutions don't carry the trust of the people, you won't be able to do it. Or if you are talking about that, is it a long haul? <laughs> yes, it is a long haul. There are no shortcuts in it. Pakistan GDP ratio, you've been doing so many programs. You've been doing for years. You've been talking to so many economists, so many business people who are coming here and everybody's talking, you do this, you do that. What is important that people are not trusting you and why they are not trusting you? Because you have a regulatory capture, which everybody knows, but nobody would talk about, about this bull in the China shop. Yeah. And you just talk about cosmetic measures that, okay, do this, improve this, and uh, increase this, reduce this, make new things. But people always find ways to get out of it. And even, unfortunately, your state machinery also facilitate people to do that. That's a part of life. They help out people to evade taxes also. So important thing for us to understand that if you want to improve these things, the most important point is this, that you have to have a rule of law a strong rule of law, which has to be seen. People have to be facilitated. Till the time I don't have the bottom side, I mean to say in the business side, I'm not talking about big businesses. I'm talking about businesses which are at the small and medium level, which is more broad based. We talk about gimmicks. We talk about Faisal very, I mean to say very openly that let's have IT and IT is going to safeguard ourselves. My dear, in Bangladesh, there is no IT which have took them into the most growing nation. My I country, Rosie, it is the textile. It, my, no, textile is not even there. Textiles have total share of 15% if you're looking at from that perspective. But sir, uh, Bangladesh has, has become the second largest textile producer, garment producer after China. So looking the, at the, the size of the country and looking at the output, the, that's amazing. Bangladesh has a GDP of $275 billion they have an exports of $42 billion. If you look at the total GDP, it is around 15%, not more than that, 15%. It means 85% of the GDP is produced by something else also. 
Mm-hmm. That's what you need to understand. Big countries like us, China, India, Bangladesh, or Nigeria, or these big countries, we will not be able to sustain our countries only onto the exports. We have to look at the domestic market also. So what is important for Pakistan to understand that don't go for gimmicks. Any person who have some excess, any aptima, any FPCCI, they go and safeguard and they tell you that if you help them, if you give them that incentive, that is a panacea for the economic well-being of the country. Unfortunately, that is not like that. Is not for the okay, country. Okay, sir, uh, another uh, statement issued by the State Bank of Pakistan is regarding the large-scale manufacturing, and they have uh, said that 4.8 uh, percent growth has been witnessed in the uh, LSM large-scale manufacturing. Uh, and interestingly, they said it is textile, food and beverages, petroleum products, paper and board, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, cement, fertilizer, and rubber products. So primarily, these are the areas. I mean, I think. Uh, Pakistan is doing better and when you look at construction and the related businesses to construction the focus of the government is on that side also so do you think if construction area really picks it up well a lot of employment would be created and so many other businesses would also flourish and grow along with that look when you are talking about construction construction is not a primary industry it's normally complement the industry where the people are making money and they are investing into it. Unfortunately, Pakistan is being developed, or I mean to say it's been coming up more as a plotistan as compared to real state business, which we talk about. In your country, the REITs, the REITs, I mean to say they have not picked up. In your country, most of the money, which you call a black money, is still residing there. So it means it's a dead capital which is residing much of this real estate. Even if government is going to work out on that real estate, the construction side, what is more important that they are, your real economy is not going to work. Who is going to buy those flats, those houses, those offices? Most important point is this. If you look at the New Deal projects which have been done in US in 1930s at a Roosevelt time to take it out from the economic uh, problems, from the economic downfall, it was basically large scale projects which are infrastructure side projects. It was not office buildings being done in Manhattan to take US out from it. It was large scale, just like in 1960s in Pakistan. We have large scale infrastructure projects like we have seen in China also at times. It's a large scale infrastructure project. Unfortunately, this regulatory capture in Pakistan is very strong and uh, they have got all the airtime also. They have got all the media support also. And whatever they tell you, they tell you. The people have become rich who are at the top. But unfortunately, Pakistan as a country is not going ahead. I have just given you figures. Figures are not lying. I have given you the figures of Bangladesh and Pakistan. Bangladesh has far, far less land. They have got more pressure of the population. But what they have done, they have basically role their real economy that is what is important are you seeing a real economy yes you're getting some figures that food is moving and these moving but what is the real economy sme sector we need to know what is an sme sector is to doing be very honest sir never heard about any reforms in the sme sector and that is the backbone of any economy in the world sir and i'll, I'll come back to you on that sir now uh, let me just put a question to you here sir regarding the inflation i mean the government believes that the food inflation will be controlled and it is all about the demand and supply <coughs> factor and people have been identified who are the uh, holders basically and you know when you hold we all know what happens at the end of the day making money but whatever you talk about wheat you talk about sugar you talk about so many other commodities food vegetables so and so forth now so when you talk about the food inflation if that comes in control do you think we'll be, have, we'll be having some sort of a margin to further lower the interest rate from 7% to further down in the corona times when you witness that countries like USA, uh, they're working at 0% because of the current economic conditions? Or you believe that no, uh, Pakistan can manage things by maintaining the uh, interest rate at 7%? First, look, first of all, I am against interest rate. 
at all. Because being a Muslim, Allah has told us, if you do this, you are fighting with me and with my Prophet It's open war. You can Sood, take, as they call Sood, it. Hmm? Interest rate. Hmm. You can talk about the non-believer, so you are not responsible for that. But being a believer, so when you declare a war against Allah, you do whatever you want to do, you will not be succeeded. You can take example, uh, you can say, oh, that country is doing, that country is doing. But I believe what Allah has said, there is, that is the problem is there. One thing and second thing. By this interest rates, what, if you look at the pure economic terms, what ills it have? Accumulation of wealth. In the few hands, when we are talking about the elite capture, even in the most advanced countries, which they talk about, they are having the best trickle down policies still inequality is increasing there. So inequality is increasing there. Why? The corporate sector, they were, when they are talking about, they are benefiting from the billion, they are taking billions of dollar concessions in the term of low, uh, zero percent uh, interest rate. Still their economy is not recovering. One thing or, is right. Say if you allow me, if you've been joined in by mm -hmm. Hafiz Pasha Saab, a uh, senior economist uh, and I think one of the uh, big names as far as the economy or the economic matters uh, they are concerned. Slava alaikum Hafiz Pasha Saab. Ji, Sir, thank you so much for taking your time out and talking to us. Now, uh, we were having a word regarding uh, the IMF pressure, or maybe if pressure is not the appropriate word, or maybe, you know, whenever they try to, uh, you know, apply certain uh, formulas and they guide you how to go about it. Now, sir, we will just get back to you. I think we just lost the connection, but yeah, you may continue, <coughs> sir. Okay, second thing on a food inflation. We had enough wheat. Why is the price is increasing? Then why there's a shortage? We had enough sugar. Why there's a shortage? Number one thing, our policy for agriculture. When I'm talking about the agriculture, it starts from the production to market, to the supply, to reach to the consumer. They are very, very fake. Because actually, we don't have the policy. For example, for just to start, let's start by talking about the cost of production and the cost of production side. We are giving blanket subsidy. Mm -hmm. Faisal Sahib, in Pakistan, there are 8.2 million, million farms. 8.24 million farms. Out of them, 7.34 million, they are less than 12 acres. 7.34 million, less than 12 acres. And less than one acre is 1.23 million. Less than 2.5 acre is 2.3 million. Now you are giving the blanket subsidy. Do you think the farmer who has a less than one acre will be able to afford this uh, subsidy? Never. Subsidy doesn't mean that you just pick up top 10, 15 names from every single uh, province and just facilitate them. They would pick up the urea, the other stuff and they would hold and then the poor That's man what I'm is saying. It's a blanket subsidy. We need to go for the targeted subsidy. This, I, I, I worked on so the policy. targeted subsidy, but you know, when, when you hear that uh, these trillionaires, not billionaires, trillionaires who are, uh, you know, controlling the sugar sector in Pakistan primarily, they end up getting huge amounts of subsidies, so yet the prices are skyrocketing, yet the availability is an issue. That's, that so don't you think this is the time to just go after the person? I worked on a methodology. I say it is a two-edged targeted subsidy. For, first of all, we have to limit the subsidy below the 12.5 acre on the production side. Give the free of cost co uh, these inputs to the less than 2.5 acre people. Sir, you uh, allow me, you know, uh, because we've been again uh, joined in by Hafiz Pasha sir. Uh, by sir, sorry, uh, we had some uh, technical issue before, but now uh, you're back. Uh, we were talking about the overall economic situation in Pakistan. We were having a word about the tax collection, increasing the tax base, lowering the interest rate. Now, again, let me repeat this question to you earlier that uh, currently the government really believes that, you know, we need to look after the inflation and uh, there is a certain policy <coughs> that is going to be in place. Uh, government is going to take some very strict measures against all those who are not uh, complying and then uh, on top, we have big names. Uh, they are trillionaires and then we hear from the Prime Minister that there are mafias in the sugar side, in wheat, you name it. So obviously, the one challenge is about uh, looking after the affairs of the mafia, but at the same time, the presence of the product at a 
at an affordable price is the key. Now, how to go about it, sir? Let's start off from that. Food inflation. Basha Saab. Basha Saab, can you hear me, sir? I think, I think there's some... But yeah, you may continue, sir. So, I was sharing with you. So, I, I'm working on a double-edge targeted subsidy methodology. So, first of all, we have to limit the subsidy on the production side less than 12.5 acre. So, give the subsidy free of cost these inputs to the farmers which are le which hold less than 2.5 acre. Then you can decrease 50 percent, 20 percent, 10 percent. Targeted subsidy. Target, as not say. more than 12.5 acre. Keep it below the 12.5 acre. Similarly, when we are talking about on the food side, on the consumption side, definitely we have to keep the prices low because the number of people living in uh, peri-urban areas, in urban areas, they are poor. Even in the village, uh, rural areas, the number of people who are the non-farming community, even the people who have the 2.5 acre, they cannot produce everything. They have to buy oil, they have to buy the spices, they have to other Every vegetables mostly. and fruits, everything. Mm -hmm. So then identify the people who are connected with the SAS program and the people who have less than 50,000 50, rupees per month income, those families, give them the food subsidy. Not more than that. The blanket subsidy is a problem. Ramesh Saab, I remember the French government gives a lot of subsidy to the agriculture sector. They compete primarily, it is in the wine sector because for them, you know, it's a, it's a produce, one of the best in the world, consumed all over the globe, value addition primarily. Now you talk about Pakistan and you are absolutely spot on that whatever should be done by the uh, Zari Tarekyati Bank, the Agriculture Development Bank as we know, it used to be called that one time, ZBTL primarily, do you think they are doing the right job? Because we have heard there is so much corruption out there, you know, on, on personal level, I have seen good men going there and their proposals were being rejected and whoever had the influence when they went and that, you know, things got so clear and this is a reality. Yes, I gave you one example from China when the Mazatang came to the power. So he identified three things as an evil, which I have also written in this book. So one of those evil, uh, two, I will mention the two evils of those. One was a corruption. And second was a bureaucracy. So you can find the magnitude what would be happening there. And that was the basis of the cultural revolution in China. Because you cannot fix them, you have to take the strongest measures to control them. Because basically they are running your country. Yep. They are everywhere. You cannot say they are one at one place. Even if the government have to make any policy, they need information from the union council level. Who will give them that information? It's not possible every time you go for the survey. So that's what Imran Khan Saab says that, you know, whatever numbers were given to me, they were wrong. So about that's, the, <laughs> about that's the what I'm saying. So we need to be, we need to calculate few things very clearly. Number one, if we're talking about to control, to get the true information, we need to have some other system where we can get the information. Like China, they use their political party. They get the information from each and every village through their party. But the problem is, in our structure, the political parties, they are, the, they are uh, belong to some family. They are not the political parties. These are the family parties. These are the family parties. So, we have, as a, at this point of the time, so we are facing problem from the every corner. So, who will fix it? That is a fundamental question. Mm -hmm. If we need something to fix it, we need everybody from this country need to understand. If they were thinking, they will take money out of this country and they can live happily and outside of the uh, outside of this country. They should, they must keep in mind the Islamophobia by the speed which they are. It is happening in the Western countries. Even look around. So what is happening in the most secular countries? They are introducing the new bills and the new uh, everything. Mm -hmm. One thing and second thing. So anti-money laundering bills and uh, uh, mayors. So whenever they need your money, they will implement their law and they will take away your money. So it is a better to think about your own country to make some 
radical changes at this point of time i don't think so there is a, i always uh, favor the evolution but unfortunately at a, we have reached at a, at a situation where i don't see the evolution can help us we no need the radical changes in our system not in one sphere of the life in every sphere of the life as a uh, shabbat zaidi sir were talking about few days back when the leading business community met to the uh, army chief they started to talk about their personal problems not with the problems which is related to the industry or the which was related to the business environment so everybody is focused on the personal problem then how you can take uh, say that so we are talking about the country so that is a fundamental thing which we need to understand that's why i always say if the political parties they are really sincere mm. to this country every political parties uh, they all political parties should sit together and work on chartered of economy of this country and make it the past uh, part of the constitution and there there, sh there should be some they should make a decision whoever will come into the power the charter will not be changed and no single party will take the credit for that charter if they are sincere to this country and if they are sincere only to the their own constituency you know, your personal interest uh, 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 unfortunately overwhelms the national interest and that is where the problem seems to be there has to be a collective approach there has to be a sane mind sitting somewhere taking appropriate decisions so if you allow me uh, let me have a a question with um bande sab bande sab uh, there's this story in in the nation it says that uh, the chairman all pakistan cotton power uh, looms association uh, rana azhar wakar has said that the for the first time since 1990 the government has taken great decisions regarding the textile um, uh, industry in faisalabad and he said that over 50000 closed power looms units they have been restored Uh, job obviously uh, <coughs> i mean whosoever was not uh, working before will start working subsidized rates uh, on, on the energy input and at the same time uh, you know you're talking about a huge chunk and fasla baat is is the base as far as uh, the economy is concerned obviously and, and in particular regarding textile now such steps i mean they are there they will uh, definitely <coughs> yield results uh, at a given time but if you look at certain things they are also moving in the right direction obviously i'm not saying the 100% right but at least things have started uh, you know working and especially during the corona times and god knows when this menace is going to finish but now the doctors believe that mm -hmm. it is going to be there for some time today there was story the schools have been uh, closed again from the 26th of um, uh, november obviously the threat is there so under the given circumstances how do you see this kind of measure sir no i totally agree i mean to say uh, you have rightly said faisalabad is the third in the country and it is basically per economy when you're talking about looms when you're talking about textile that's what we want to look forward and i tell you very frankly i've been to faisalabad off and on again the faisalabad who has made its mark it was made its mark these looms are from the sme sector they were not yeah, big exactly. names hmm. these people were working in mixed use areas without zoning i mean to see you go into the faisalabad you go through the city and you will find that entrepreneurial energy over there they have not made money by some big bahria towns and all those things it was sheer power and resilience of those people who brought pakistan to that edge where it was called manchester of the country even as of today faisalabad as compared to lahore and karachi export more textiles so what is important that we have to support that city we have to support that because that is the sector which is going to create jobs which is going to create the whole value chain which is going to create the purchasing power in the economy through which you can buy all these plots and flats and houses and all those things that is important one thing more which i want to talk to you i don't know whether the people over here has discussed or not because i was just following and shakil is sitting with you rame he is also a very big proponent of china do you know that chinese nowadays are supporting street economy in their country the prime minister li pe chiang in early june 2020 they basically mention 
that we have to revive street economies in our urban centers and i was just following it it was so amazing thing that they were the same chinese government who were chasing out these street vendors from their streets that they are making their country ugly but now if you see the second largest economy of the world 12 trillion gdp and that economy's prime minister is mentioning i was just going to certain videos also and it was very surprising that street vendors are saying that they have got a call from the city police to come and utilize the space for uh, selling their wares and goods and all those things and Now we are doing the opposite I, and that's what i call it that is a broad based economic growth that is an inclusion do any finance minister or any elite over here or any minister has ever talk about it that we are going to talk about street vendors to come do you know shandu city has issued 130000 licenses in this city in recent months for these street vendors and do you know in islamabad we have how many licenses for these kokas which was issued by cda i have got no they idea sir please inform us they were 500 and those 500 also were rescinded about a year back and the people they went to the high court these kokka association people they went to the high court and i court simply threw their petition out on this pretext that as per the law cda can always revoke these licenses so okay. as of today islamabad don't have those license all these people who are basically operating they are unlicensed they are illegal and who have the those licenses this is a question and who has those licenses big name big senators and the this big big name for the khokas yes ask him yeah bade sir let's disclose it <laughs> okay i'm not going in those details but what is important for me to understand my country which has a per capita income of 1500 dollars per year Correct. okay and a country which has a per capita income of 10000 dollars that country is pushing street economy in that country who has these alibabas tencent and i don't know what sort of a big brands technology they have developed fasal these guys are pushing for because they know that only technology only textile only machinery is not going to take you forward because they the are looking after all these segments everyone. primarily and you are looking at yes, the lower level i have been to china everyone. and banesh sir you have been to china so many times i mean you would see um you know over here the issue is regarding the encroachment unfortunately because you know if you allow three people 30 people will end up there there and and you know there will be no parking space available there would be a problem for the pedestrians there would be a problem for the people who is who are commuting from one place to another and this is what what happens but the way the, the chinese for example you would find fresh pineapples you know on a place this big and the lady or the man or whoever is there you know they would just give you in no time 30 40 maybe seconds or maybe a minute you know a whole uh, pineapple mm. cut into slices and all fresh and yeah. this is how exactly. how how things are brewing and so like we have uh, pakora shops or samosa shops or for that matter you know uh, like small scale uh, businesses all over uh, pakistan i would say including islamabad but you're right that when you look at the agent of a country like china for that matter look at 60 to 70 crore people who came out of the poverty line and now they are pretty well established i think that kind of a focus sh- should also be here in pakistan i'm not not saying every every city but this is uh, what people <clears throat> do last time in ramadan nobody could uh, make that kind of money because you know the seasonal uh, income i would say you know people uh, start small businesses in in the month of ramadan you know for for an additional income and so and so forth nothing was happening your take no no i totally agree with you i mean to say what is important for us to talk about it we should not talk about only big numbers or large manufacturing the future of this country lies with the small enterprises with the micro enterprises they are the people who basically produces most of the jobs if you look just at one chai khoka who is yeah. making chai he is basically producing employment for two more people 
or three people are employed by that you got my point and yes. if i'm looking at islamabad alone islamabad has a population of 2 million on average 1.5 to 2% will be a street vendor population you go in the sabzi mandi side you have got about 5000 vendors working over there now it means that in islamabad we need to have around 30 to 40000 vendors operating in this city and if you look at 30000 vendors and six an average family 150000 people households will be supported by this industry or this sector now that is what is important for us i'm just talking about one sector and you talk about pakistan which has a population a urban population if you just talk about it it's over 80 million so 80 million population if you look at the number of people which they can support it around about 1.2 to 1.5 million who will be the part of that workforce so just imagine the size which we is being ignored and we are talking about big numbers we are talking about big technologies we are talking about ai which are not going to produce employment down below i'm not against the technology side that's a part of an economic but Absolutely. for god's sake don't get blind don't get blind with these fads you are a country of 220 million people most of them will never have that sort of skill set to be a part of that technology what about those people we have got these rural areas has anybody thought about that we talk about only rural areas chini mangi ho gayi hai wheat mangi ho gaya that's all we talk about it we don't talk about it that how to bring those people out of poverty when you talk about china that china how they bought about the all these they had a plan and the implementation was flawless that's why they, they had such great results Blake and Rame there was, was a very strong will behind their idea as well sir bande yeah. saab may was talking about the political party the communist party unfortunately communist party is the state na in pakistan we don't have that sort of a thing where pti or people's party or pmln any party is a state it's not a state we cannot have that model which chinese have chinese have a very different operating model of operating there the only thing which i am talking about is those principle of inclusion which chinese have irrespective you have democracy or you have dictatorship at least that inclusion element has to be there otherwise what ramya was talking about the surgery or the revolution or all those thing it will come out when people are fed up first thing you have political instability second thing you have violence in the city you have youngsters who are ready to pick up arms at any pretext whether it is religion or ethnicity anything they are why it all goes down to that exclusion nature of the economy when you have that exclusion nature people lose hope and once they lose hope you are in big shit then it's not that easy to talk about all those things and make people realize all right why we having all these all right. i mean to say street crimes and all those things it is because of that absolutely i mean i mean this is such a big huge subject bade saab and you know definitely we will be doing a show regarding the suggestions how to uplift the economy and i think uh, there are so many ideas everybody has so much uh, you know in their mind that i guess these are the decisions if they are taken at the right time and they are implemented in an appropriate way they would definitely uh, give some positive results and that is what the chinese have done and i think street economy that is something brilliant for, uh, i mean and and for it suits so much for a for an economy like pakistan for a country like pakistan for that matter bani sir was a pleasure having you thank you so much rami sir was a pleasure having you sir thank you so much uh, for your uh, for your book uh, this is understanding china for future cooperation uh, all the best sir for your future writings as well thank but you. pleasure again sir is all ours that's all we have for this hour i'll see you inshallah tomorrow at 8 till then you take good care khuda hafiz